Welcome to this episode of Rattling the Bars. We want to take this opportunity to look at a strange case that's occurring in Canada now with a political prisoner that's being sought by France and perhaps other countries. So joining me to talk about the case of Dr. Uh, Hassan Dieb is Monia Mazik and Roger Clark. Uh, thanks for joining me, uh, Monia and Roger. Well, thanks very much for inviting us and, and thanks for your interest in Hassan's story. It's a story that is not yet over. So we appreciate your interest. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me at uh, your show. I want to start off, though, uh, with uh, Roger. Uh, Roger is the support committee, the organizer, uh, uh, spokesperson for the support committee for Dr. Diab. Uh, could you kind of fill us in on what the situation is? Give us background, even though rather than the bars and, and, and the real news have done a number of uh, stories on this case is spanning 40 years. Uh, so could you kind of like tell us, give us an overview and then bring us up to where we are now? Okay, uh, thanks, Eddie. Um, yeah, as you say, this case goes back over 40 years. There was a, a bomb explosion in Paris. It happened on the 3rd of October, uh, 1980. And uh, there were investigations, of course, that went on, but nothing happened. So for almost 20 years, there was no indication whatsoever that the French police had any leads or any information. And then suddenly in the late 1990s, uh, some secret intelligence reports coming from, we even now don't know exactly where from, uh, but likely from East Germany at the time and perhaps Israel, uh, gave the name Hassan Diab. And uh, so a, a French journalist came over to Canada uh, a, few, a few years later, it's uh, in 2007 now, so years are going by, nothing is happening, and confronts Hassan as he's coming out of a class. He was teaching university here in Ottawa and said, uh, do you know the police are looking for you? You're suspected of planting a bomb. Well, he didn't know anything about it, of course, and uh, was completely surprised. But uh, a few months later, France actually asked for his extradition, uh, submitted various uh, documents, bits of what they called evidence and so forth, uh, most of which has turned out actually to be wrong or bad or non-existent. Uh, but nevertheless, Hassan was arrested by the Canadian police and uh, was put in detention for several months and then was put out on bail. And I'll just say this very quickly, but he was on bail under ridiculous conditions. He was being followed. He couldn't, uh, he lost his teaching job after some uh, protests from various groups within Canada. And um, he was um, obliged to wear a bracelet, an electronic bracelet, which he wore uh, day in, day out, and he had to pay for that himself. He had to pay 2,000 Canadian dollars a month. It's a small detail, but it shows the sort of degree of harassment. Uh, the extradition process lasted quite a long time, from 2008, 2009, right up to 2014, when Hassan was extradited to Paris very quickly and hastily. Uh, I won't go into the details, but basically he couldn't even say goodbye to his uh, family. Uh, he was then put in prison in France. Uh, we're talking about November 2014. And he stayed in prison, mostly in solitary confinement, for over three years. Now, the important thing about all of that is that when people are extradited, they're extradited to face charges. In this case, there were no charges laid. In fact, the three and a bit years that Hassan spent in prison all of that time, the French continued their investigations into his case. They followed one lead after another. Some of the judges recommended that he be freed on bail. The prosecution overturned that. Uh, and then after just over three years, two very um, good investigators, and I have to give them credit because they 
looked into everything. They traveled to Lebanon. They found evidence that Hassan, in fact, was in Lebanon at the time of the 1980 bombing. So there was very strong alibi evidence. And there was a lot more handwriting evidence that was produced to justify his extradition, but in fact turned out to be wrong. The experts made a mistake and they were criticized very heavily. So on the basis of all of that, in January of 2018, Hassan was actually freed and returned to Canada. Uh, we were hoping that that was the end of the story. Unfortunately, it's not. It got worse. Uh, the French prosecutor appealed Hassan's release and, uh, in fact, demanded that he face trial. And that was uh, also in uh, 2018. That process has gone on for another two years, and the appeal court, in fact, sent Hassan to trial. Hassan appealed against that, and last week, the Supreme Court in Paris, the Cour de Cassation, actually denied Hassan's appeal, basically upholding the lower court, which has sent, uh, will, will send Hassan to trial and maybe face extradition one more time, a process which may go on for a year or two, but that's where we are right now. Okay, all right. Oh, Monia, I understand that you kind of ex personally experienced something similar to this with your husband, uh, and not to take away from uh, Dr. Dieb's case, but give me a little background, what happened to your husband, and then how you find yourself involved in this case, if, if you will. Sure, sure. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, Real News for inviting me and uh, Rogers to the show. Um, yeah, very briefly, um, I think it's very important to reframe this conversation that we are having into the ongoing war on terror and to into the, uh, I would say, uh, international, uh, quite uh, um, very much mainstream Islamophobia that uh, we are still um, living in it uh, in different countries, whether it is in France, whether in Canada or in the United States. So I think it's very important for the listeners or people who watch this program to keep in mind these two um, important um, sort of lines. Um, yes, in 2002, my husband, Meher Arar, who is a Canadian citizen, uh, born uh, originally from uh, Syria. So um, he was born in Damascus, um, but came in 1988 to Canada and lived since in Canada. He was arrested by the American authorities on his way from Tunisia, where I am originally from, uh, where I was at that time with both of my kids. And he was arrested uh, on a stopover um, at the um, JFK Kennedy Airport um, and arrested by the uh, FBI. And uh, since I kind of uh, lost um, contact with him, I didn't know I was waiting for him to call me from Canada because that was his uh, last supposed to be last destination. Uh, this is, yeah, this was September 2002, one year after 9-11, and all the new procedure of fingerprinting, uh, stopping, um, profiling uh, people from certain countries uh, were in place for the first time, actually after uh, the 9-11 attacks. And my husband found himself um, thrown into this new era, post era of 9-11. And um, he was put in detention, uh, incommunicado, so in solitary confinement um, into the Metropolitan Detention Center in New York. I couldn't contact him, he couldn't contact me, he was strip searched, he was blindfolded. Um, and after a few weeks from that, uh, he was uh, put in a plane and deported to unwillingly, actually they tried so hard, the American authorities, um, to let him sign on a deportation paper. And he found himself in Jordan from there, he was taking to Syria. So all this 
uh, of course, I knew it later on. All these details were uh, for me uh, unknown. All the new I knew at that time was that he disappeared. The Canadian government did uh, very, very little uh, at the beginning, quite frankly, I mean, until the end, uh, because all they kept saying, he's, um, he's a Syrian citizen, he's in Syria, there is not really much we can do right now. So um, thanks to um, organization, a human rights organization, activists, um, some dedicated journalists, I was able to uh, raise the um, the case into the Canadian media, into the Canadian public, and I asked constantly for the uh, repatriation and the return of my husband, who has not, like in the case of Hassan Dieb, never uh, charged with any crime. Um, they kept saying that he is a suspected terrorist, he's, he, he is associated with Al-Qaeda, there were no evidence, there were no um, formal charges. Of course, in Syria, he was um, uh, tortured, he was kept um, underground uh, in a detention center. And um, thanks to all the work that we were able to do in Canada, the Canadian politicians were able to uh, work and put some pressure uh, and ask the Syrian to release him, and then he was able to come to Canada. So, I, I mean, unfortunately for Dr. Diab, of course, things are still going on after his return. And um, I think the stakes are uh, even here higher. Maybe we can talk about it that later on. Um, but it is, again, uh, as I said at the very beginning, this is a continuation of... Uh, even if they don't say it or they don't explicitly, you know, uh, keep telling it, this is a continuation of the war on terror. This is the continuation of uh, those anti-terrorist legislation. Uh, and of course, in France, um, it's a very, very uh, special, specific uh, situation where um, the government is, uh, without explicitly saying it, targeting it um, majority sort of community uh, of, of Muslim uh, French with different laws. So all this is not at all helping Dr. Diab in his um, seek for justice. Mm. Uh, Roger, can, can you tell me, because I understand the, the first time they extradited him uh, was without any uh, evidence of a trial or or any uh, valid proof. Uh, uh, I thought that was against the law in Canada. What's the law about extraditing uh, Canadian citizens to uh, uh, another country? Well, there are a couple of points. One is that the Canadian Extradition Act is uh, very defective. Uh, one of the reasons that Hassan was uh, extradited to France uh, brought to light a lot of the failings of the Extradition Act itself. Uh, and it, you're right in that uh, really there is no protection such as one would uh, expect from a court of law. Uh, witnesses cannot be called, evidence cannot be challenged. And uh, a lot of uh, lawyers in Canada would say that uh, it's sufficient for a foreign country to send a, a, a very brief file of accusation and that this will be sufficient in order to obtain the extradition of that individual. Uh, and that's one thing that we've seen. Uh, but I'd like to also add to what Monia has just said, a very important point, and that is the sort of social, cultural, political mood around what is going on and what was going on even then. I mean, we're talking even in the 1980s, uh, terrorist attacks and so on were occurring in various parts of Europe, and this has continued. Uh, and not to say that we shouldn't be taking those seriously. Of course, we have to. It's very important. But at the same time, it's created a mood of suspicion, uh, a circumstance where people can be uh, investigated but evidence not brought forward to justify trial 
uh, in France right now, in addition to a very strong mood of Islamophobia, there is also a shift to what would be called the political right. The, uh, the Macron and others are afraid of uh, people like Marine Le Pen. And so there is a shift towards a hard line, law and order, uh, reinforce the police activities, all of these things are going on right now in France, and Hassan falls into the middle of some of that. I mean, the, the real question, and uh, Eddie, you were sort of uh, hinting at this earlier, where the, there is no evidence. Uh, certainly at the time, the French tried to produce handwriting evidence. They brought in experts. It turns out after many years, that the experts themselves were faulty. The, uh, what they swore was uh, in fact true was not true. And the Court of Appeal that uh, in January of this year said that Hassan must go to trial was in fact using wrong evidence, non-existent evidence, was making up things. And all of that we know because it came out in the report from the investigative judges who set him free. Uh, the alibi is a very big point. Uh, Hassan maintained from the beginning that he was actually in Beirut in October of 1980. He was a university student in his early 20s. He was writing his exams. Uh, so one of the investigating judges actually traveled to Lebanon, was able to interview students who were there at the same time as Hassan, who confirmed that he was in fact there, uh, was able to obtain documents from Beirut University showing that Hassan was in fact taking his exams. So the, the alibi evidence itself, which in most courts would be more than sufficient to show the innocence of the individual, has been set aside. Uh, and, and so we go on. So I think the question of why, why is he being pursued in the light of all of this? What is this judicial nightmare that is haunting him and which seems to now have no end. And why are the French courts playing this sort of game? Uh, even senior uh, uh, prosecution uh, assistants, uh, the, the uh, avocat général, advised the appeal court to uphold Hassan's appeal, but they didn't, they ignored it. So we have to ask what, what really is going on? There is no evidence, not a scrap of evidence, to show that he is guilty. There is a lot of evidence that shows he is innocent. So that's the question. Oh, uh, Mona, uh, can you, you, you talk for a minute about the, the climate, uh, both of y'all did, but you talked about the climate in France, the Islamophobia, the, uh, the, uh, now, obviously, the right-wing government uh, uh, that's that's uh, uh, pushing the issue uh, against Islam and uh, the, the the whole cartoon character kind of thing and all the stuff that's going on is that climate the source of this or is this coming from a third country, a bigger country, or a smaller country? Or a country with a vested interest, or um, and 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 what's the mood in Canada in relationship to this hostility? Yes, I think um, it's not a secret at all that uh, France has been. Um, uh, I mean, with uh, there is a whole heritage of uh, colonialism, of Islamophobia, and uh, despite what uh, some French politicians are claiming that this is all important from the United States, this kind of Black Lives Matter movement or any sort of cancel culture that they call it, despite the claim that they are saying this is all important from the United States, I think it is a reality, France, um, has been um, an empire, an empire, and a colonial power, and um, it hosts uh, one of the uh, biggest uh, Muslim community in Europe. So I think you know the facts are there, and uh, we cannot. Uh, um, I, I, I think we cannot disagree on these facts. Um, France has been uh, the first uh, European country to introduce 
um, laws against uh, wearing the headscarf by uh, Muslim women. Uh, this today, what we are talking about, the Islamic um, separatism bill that is going to become a law. Uh, so I think, yes, there is, you spoke about a mood. Yes, there is a general mood in France where um, anything that has to do with uh, Islam is going to be considered as suspicious as a scary. And of course, the facts, the other facts is that there were a different um, terrorist attack on the French soil. I think those are not helping at all the case of Hassan Diab because when he first arrived in France, after he was extradited by Canada, um, the Charlie Hebdo attacks happened, the Bataclan happened. And the, those acts, they keep happening, unfortunately, of course, I mean, very recently with the Samuel Paty killing of that teacher. Um, I mean, yes, French, I think in general, they are shocked. They are still very much scared of what's going on, but the politicians are taking advantage of this fear. Uh, and we are not saying that the fear is not legitimate, but I think they are going so far into their uh, partisan sort of uh, tricks and games to gain more votes and of course Macron today would like to um, you know to to get some of the voters instead of my, his uh, political opponent Marine Le Pen so he would like to do you know uh, more than the king right being more uh, doing things more uh, than the king. So I think he wants to um, to kind of uh, get a part of this uh, right wing sort of voters by um, issuing these laws and measures that targets, uh, quite frankly, um, you know, uh, people uh, who are conducting their uh, normal business, but they are becoming today as the enemy of the Republic or as so I think, yes, the mood is very, very here uh, important. And we, I'm not saying that, um, you know, um, the, the French legal system is biased, but I think we are the judges, the police, you know, people, everyone hear those news. And of course, everybody is influenced. So um, those decisions are going to be somehow influenced and part of this general mood. Um, I would like to go back a little bit here to um, two things. Um, when Hassan Diab was arrested in Canada, first time in 2008, uh, we are also living into similar sort of mood. We had Stephen Harper here, um, you know, as a prime minister, he is from the right, uh, really very strong right, conservative agenda, law and order, were re-established as part of the legal agenda. And I think, yeah, once again, Hassan was caught part of that general uh, atmosphere where, you know, let's call it, it's kind of um, witch hunting. You know, we want to find no matter what, uh, no matter how flimsy the evidence, no matter how inexistent the evidence, we want to find this scapegoat. And I think, yeah, Hassan Diab represented very well that person. Um, to go back, uh, another example, when my husband was arrested in 2002, I faced the same sort of, uh, you know, mood backlash from the general population, from the politicians saying, well, he has been arrested by the American, so there is no fire, there is no smoke without fire, so he must be guilty somehow. And instead of finding all the evidence to prove that he is innocent, uh, you are going to find whole sort of um, uh, people, organization, politician, journalists who are going to find every single little thing that is going to prove that, aha, uh -huh, he committed, or he might be, or he must have been involved somehow. And this is called the tunnel vision, because what we, we fix our objective, and we are going to build all our thinking to uh, really like validate this sort of objective. And this is totally, totally wrong. So as if the French said, Hassan Diab is guilty, we are going to find 
everything that is going to support this instead of actually doing the reverse. He is innocent and we have to uh, you know, uh, prove that, that he's guilty. So I think this is dangerous. Um, we lived into that era. We are still living into it, whether it is um, you know, Canada, uh, of course, today with the less political sort of um, agenda that we had compared to uh, the era of Stephen Harper. But uh, once again, those general movement in different countries, the right wing, uh, the populist agenda are making these cases more and more difficult to gain sympathy uh, from general public, but then it is reflected on the judgment by the um, legal decisions, unfortunately. Okay, but follow, follow up to that. Uh, the ca Canadian population, say, um, uh, the news media, uh, and you're a journalist yourself, uh, what's the traffic like there? How, how is, is there a, a feeling, uh, uh, Islamophobic feeling in Canada, say in general, uh, uh, about this particular case or, or the relationship of this case to other countries that Canada might like? Uh, uh, how, that, do, could you put your finger on the pulse of the Canadian attitude right now? Uh, as opposed to how it was when they first shipped them all, uh, Dr. Diaz, that is. Of course, there is a lot of change since. Yes, definitely. I mean, uh, at the very beginning, I remember um, there was a lot of um, non-sympathetic sort of articles. And of course, uh, once again, Mr. Diab was considered as guilty uh, by default um, because also France um, asked for his extradition. So as if, you know, the fact that another developed democratic country, so that gave him as if, you know, in the eyes of the public and some journalists, as if this gave uh, a legitimate sort of uh, call and um, a legitimate sort of uh, a clear accusation, uh, no matter what. So I think, yes, but the more the case progressed and the more, of course, evidence was uh, sort of uh, uh, either squash or uh, uh, came out into light, like what Rogers was saying, you know, those two investigative, like those uh, um, uh, judges or uh, officer who went to to Lebanon, I think those are really like incredible, incredible pieces of evidence. Um, imagine we are talking here about 1980. So it's really 40 years old. And uh, to, to find um, witnesses who are going to, to say, no, this is not true. He was writing exam with us. I think this is really big. Nevertheless, so that helped switch the narrative. And we here in Canada, uh, we had a, a public inquiry uh, after my husband was arrested in 2000, uh, between 2004 until 2007. And that public inquiry, I would say, um, and I don't say that only, I mean, a lot of observers can uh, agree with that, uh, switch back the pendulum, you know, uh, to a certain sort of, uh, a balance between human rights and security. So I think people are becoming and journalists are becoming more and more aware that you know you cannot be part of this frenzy of uh, you know yeah yeah we caught another Arab another um, uh, terrorist and we are going to put him in jail. I think people understood that there is um, there are other you know uh, stakes there. The national security agenda is really here uh, being pushed by some groups, by some politicians, by some, you know, um, lobbies. So we have to really be careful between um, what we what we see, what you know, and 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 what's going on in reality. So the general mood, I would say, we are not in two thousand and two anymore. We are not in two thousand and eight when Hassan was first arrested and later on extradited. Nevertheless, we still have in Canada uh, a lot of education 
um, to, to, to give to our journalists and to some of the politicians. So, and there are still lobbies when, when Mr. Hassan Diab was first uh, arrested and he was a teacher at Carlton University, lobbies like uh, Benai Breath right away stood up and put the pressure and some alumni group also put the pressure on the Carlton University to dismiss him, to um, get him out of his position. And that was very quickly. There were no evidence, but still. So I think those groups are still um, active. They are still very vocal. And um, unfortunately for Hassan, um, he is some sort of a victim into this sort of uh, rhetoric. You know, we found the person and we cannot let him go. So um, we have always, always to balance and to um, be careful because despite some changes, real good changing, Islamophobia is around the corner. Um, those agendas, you know, who are higher than us, you know, more um, uh, international sort of lobby groups, they are still there and we cannot allow someone to be caught into this uh, labyrinth, into this maze and uh, see his life, literally his life and the life of his family really be devastated. Mm -hmm. Let me, uh, Roger, let me just step back one minute because uh, you explained uh, the piece about the alibi in Beirut, uh, taking exams, all that. That was one thing that they, they couldn't get around. I mean, the fact of the matter is it's been validated that that's where he was. The other piece of evidence, uh, could you talk a little bit about the handwriting thing, the, trying to compare his handwriting to the handwriting of the suspect that checked in the hotel. Could you talk about that and why that's not even a valid uh, piece of evidence also? Sure, yeah. On the uh, alibi question, I think it's it's very clear. The, there is no question that the alibi is solid. Uh, it's not been uh, denied. The only question is, uh, raised by some of the appeal court judges' opinion was that, well, uh, Beirut is not very far from Paris, so he could easily have hopped on a plane, traveled to France, planted the bomb, flown back and completed his exams in a couple of days. Uh, however, we know, and the, uh, the prosecution has actually said this, that the suspect was in Paris from the 22nd of September right through to the 3rd of October, a period of uh, well, nearly two weeks. Uh, so they can't have it both ways. Uh, there's no evidence in any case that uh, Hassan left Beirut during that time. So the alibi is, is very, very solid. Um, the prosecution tried to say, well, there is no evidence for the day of the bomb attack itself. Uh, ignoring the fact that they themselves were saying he was there for a much longer time. So it, it falls apart very quickly. Uh, on the handwriting, uh, this has been very revealing and it still is a, an important point. Um, the suspect, when he was preparing to plant the bomb in 1980, stayed at a small hotel in Paris. Uh, and in those days, when you stayed at a hotel, you filled in a registration card. And so there is, in fact, the police found a registration card apparently signed by the, uh, the suspect, the bomber. Uh, it's uh, printed in block capital letters. There's only about five words on it. It's a, a false name that is given, a Cypriot name, but that's uh, neither here nor there. But what the prosecution tried to affirm and what they sent to Canada was the so-called handwriting evidence that the block capital letters from what, uh, 28 years earlier, were those of Hassan Diab. Okay, so there we are. We're listening at, <laughs> during the uh, extradition hearings and here is this so-called evidence. The first thing is that it turned out that some of the handwriting evidence that was being compared was in fact not written by Hassan at all. It was written by somebody else that he was staying with at the time. So they were comparing something that now is known not to be his. Uh, in fact, it was so embarrassing that the French authorities withdrew 
uh, from the extradition hearing in, in Canada, they withdrew the handwriting evidence and submitted a second set of expertise, so-called. And uh, it came to the same conclusion. They said, oh yeah, there's every indication that this is Hassan's writing and so on. Um, what Hassan's defense lawyers did was, as one would expect, very professional. They brought in four handwriting experts, world renowned, one from the States, one from Canada, one from the UK, and later from Switzerland. And all of them showed that the methodology used to prove that the handwriting was indeed Hassan's was completely faulty. It was a flawed methodology. It did not stand up. Um, but nevertheless, the Canadian judge said, well, uh, this is uh, pretty solid. Uh, this is enough for me to send him to France. So it was largely on the handwriting. But there's a third part to this little story, and that is that the appeal court worried that the handwriting evidence was in fact falling apart. They called for a third report from yet more French experts. Well, <laughs> surprise, surprise, the last French experts to look at it agreed with Hassan's defense lawyers and his experts. So basically they were saying, yeah, the whole handwriting thing was, uh, I don't think they used the word farce, but let me say was a farce. Uh, it was ill-founded, it was not a serious expert analysis and should in fact be completely discarded. Uh, so that's what happened with that. Uh, so I guess what that leads to, Eddie, is, is the realization that the French legal system in this case has ignored its own evidence, in some cases has created evidence that doesn't exist, all in the name of doing, as Monia says, finding a scapegoat which will satisfy a certain extreme right or extremely political active group. But I wouldn't want to leave it there because Canada also has to play a part in all of this as well as responsibility for this ongoing fiasco. Uh, because last week when the uh, judgment came out and the decision came out confirming that Hassan should stand trial, the Canadian Minister of Justice, Lametti, said, well, we, we can't interfere because the French legal process is continuing in its proper way. And anybody who has looked into this at all has to come to the conclusion that in fact, it's not continuing in the proper way. The French legal system is letting Hassan down. There is a miscarriage of justice, a denial of justice is what I would prefer to call it. But Canada is uh, afraid of offending an ally France, uh, after all, is a traditional ally, and both France and Canada are afraid of offending Israel. And I hate to say this because I don't want to get into that sort of Middle Eastern debate, particularly now when everything that's happening in Palestine and so on is coloring the way we think about these things. But it's, it's absolutely true that uh, Hassan's case falls right into the middle of that sort of debate as well. And so as a, a Muslim, who initially was accused, incidentally, of being a Palestinian, and he never was, he's never been in Palestine, uh, but the bomb attack was attributed to a Palestinian group. Uh, but still, you can't uh, really avoid getting drawn into that political discussion, debate, agenda, and the care, the care with which Canada seems to be intent on not offending uh, France. And what we've been asking is that Canada should in fact suspend any further extradition activity with France because the legal system cannot be trusted. And it's not just us saying that, it's, it's patently obvious in everything that we've seen over the last three or four years. So, so Roger, where, okay, this decision came down from the, uh, the, the French court, uh, they are uh, calling for the extra addition. Uh, uh, where are we now? Uh, where is Dr. Diab now in terms of what's the next steps? Okay. Um, well, uh, it certainly has gone back down to the appeal court, and the appeal court is the one who uh, will now make a second decision. 
uh, having first found him guilty and uh, sending him to trial will reaffirm that. I suspect the, there may well be then a decision in the next uh, days or weeks setting a trial date for Hassan. Um, clearly, Hassan will not return to France for that trial. If there is a trial, there is absolutely no reason for him to do that. Uh, uh, such a trial, given the history of what we've seen in the French system, would be really uh, a farce and would be one more step in finding this scapegoat uh, that they so desperately seem to want to find. But let's say that uh, a trial is ordered. Uh, the trial could take place even with Hassan uh, remaining in Canada. So in absentia would be uh, uh, a typical outcome. Um, the fact that he's not there would probably play against him. And uh, so uh, we can anticipate that if there is a trial, Hassan will be found guilty. And there could be another request for his extradition made to Canada uh, in order not this time to investigate, but for him to serve a prison sentence. And, and this is what we're very afraid of. Uh, if we trusted the system, if we trusted the Canadians to do the right thing, if we believed that the French system was honorable and uh, legitimate, then we would say, yeah, fine, let, let things take their course. But it's, it's not. Uh, but all the more so that we know that Hassan is innocent. And the most disturbing thing that I've seen recently in the French media was a remark by one of the groups that's been pushing for his uh, conviction. The remark was, well, if Hassan is so innocent, why doesn't he come back and face trial? Uh, I mean, it, it's the most ludicrous argument that you can imagine being made, but it shows the desperation of those groups who are so determined to find somebody, no matter who. I, I mean, the, the victims deserve justice. We, we've said that from the very beginning. The 46 people that were injured in the bomb attack, the families of the four people who were killed, they all deserve justice. Of course they do but they do not get justice through the conviction of an innocent man. And that's the bottom line right now. So it's important to remember that Prime Minister Trudeau himself has said that everything must be done to protect Hassan Diab, Canadian citizen. And after Hassan's return from France in early 2018, Prime Minister Trudeau was asked publicly to comment on Hassan's case. And what he said on the 20th of June, 2018, is the following. I think for uh, uh, Hassan Diab, we have to recognize, first of all, that uh, what happened to him never should have happened. Uh, this is uh, something that obviously was an extremely difficult uh, uh, situation to go through for himself, for his family. Uh, and that's why we've asked for an independent external review uh, to look into exactly uh, how this happened and make sure that it never happens again. And that is really what we are going to hold the Prime Minister to right now. Okay, Mona, can, can you kind of share with us what you think at this stage of the game the public can be doing that would have, uh, would, 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 would maybe convince Canada not to go along with this? Or, uh, or just in general, uh, because, you know, there's children, there's a wife, there's family, there's all kinds of stuff. And I, I, I'm, I'm sure this is also depressing for uh, Dr. Diab itself. Uh, what should the public be doing? What can they do to kind of like give support at this stage of the game? Very, very important that this case wouldn't uh, really uh, fall out of the radar of the public. I think uh, it is very, it is incredible what uh, Rogers and the support committee has been doing to keep this case alive, to ask very important, um, you know, uh, calls from the Canadian public um, to first of all keep following the case, but also keep the uh, Canadian uh, government accountable. So I think one of the most important uh, and easy and obvious step is to write to the Prime Minister Trudeau today uh, to ask him to uh, put a stop to this, what Roger called a farce, because, you know, this is ongoing. Uh, he's going to be uh, um, 
judge abstentia and then he's going to look as if he's hiding and who knows what would happen after maybe the he he will lose again his uh, job so i think this is really uh, an ongoing and somehow this matter should stop be stopped and canada has a role it's not about interference it is about the protection of one of its own citizen the right of its own citizen this is not interference when canada um call um, you know talk with the chinese government about the release of the two michaels we have two canadian who are detained over there they are not interfering with the Can with the chinese uh government they are calling for the protection of the rights of their own citizen so i think hassan diab really deserve the same sort of uh, let's call it interference or that you know the same sort of a treatment you know in protecting his right and right now his rights as a citizen has not been protected he has been extradited despite the flimsy despite the very you know uh, uh shaky evidence um and uh and then he was in prison for almost four years in france you know there was a judge who considered this case as uh, kind of done and he really asked for his release but then we are still on and on and on with this case so i think this is a drain physically emotionally on hassan himself on his family and on his family and and uh, friends so uh, okay, this should be stopped and the role of the canadian public and i remember myself i was no longer talking with the government i was talking with the canadian public and i think this is very important the canadian public are smart they if they are really told the facts and the truth they are going to ask for the right thing to be done and i'm sure here whether it is a campaign of letters whether it is you know a, a hashtag in the social media whether it is uh, protest in front of the uh, office of the uh, prime minister office i think those are important act to keep the case alive but also to keep the demands of uh, having hassan diab rights protected and uh, this sort of um you know the, i call it I, I wrote about the case and i call it legal vendetta i think this is a really really legal vendetta because you know there is a, a difference between between pursuing justice and there is a difference between uh you know finding someone and trying to put him in prison no matter at any cost and hassan diab um using the evidence using you know legal uh, evidence has been once again you know uh found that he is innocent so why this persistence of trying to uh indict him trying to uh put him so i think keep the public informed this case should be really again um in the minds and uh, uh, and in the radar of a lot of journalists and public also canadian public and asking the um decision maker political like you know our prime minister justin trudeau to uh stand up with one of his citizen rights hassan diab deserves no um less than that okay well, what we're going to do is we're going to follow this and if there's any new developments uh reach out to us uh so we can follow up and uh uh, stay stay on top of it. Uh, so right now, Mona and Roger, thank you for joining me. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. And thank you for joining this episode of Rattling the Bars.